People underestimate the amount of nickel that's in their everyday life. There are so many applications for it, and yet it's a hidden metal because most people don't actually see pure nickel. It is everywhere you look. We see it in almost everything we touch. Nickel is omnipresent. Nickel. 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 Nickel is in everything. Seventy percent of the consumption of the world goes into stainless steel. And one of the reasons for that is, is nickel is extremely useful in making alloys. It can be disinfected. It's corrosive resistant. It's used for its energy storage capacity in batteries. It's strong at high and low temperatures. It's used for its electrical and magnetic properties, and there's virtually no other metal that will do the same job as nickel. The journey to nickel starts 80 kilometers south of the Arctic Ocean. Nickel sulfides develop in tectonic environments where you have spreading of tectonic plates. And so magma comes up from the core of the Earth, and that magma has a lot of nickel in it. We have little tiny deposits that are littered all over our 70 kilometer strike length. I think the first thing that hits people is the absolute desolate nature at Raglan. There is nothing around, it's above the tree line. We are in permafrost, and the rocks below to a depth of around 450 meters are frozen all the time. The end goal is to go from 1% of nickel to the final metal, which is 99.99% pure nickel. We start from the surface portal. We take a local ramp down. We find the ore body. We truck it up, and then that would be fed into our jaw crusher. You get it to a certain size, and then that rock is fed into our concentrator. And then that essentially just crushes the rock into a smaller and smaller size. And then we float it out. We skim it off, the nickel sulfides, and then we dry it. When the milling process is finished, the amount of material that comes out is about an 18% concentrate of nickel. We ship it to Deception Bay, which is our deep sea port about 100 kilometers north of Mine Raglan. Being so close with the surrounding communities and having a lot of the community members working at the site allows everybody to understand the perspective that each person brings to the table. Our intention here is not to come and extract the minerals and leave, but it's to develop a relationship with the host communities. And we intend to be here as a long-term partner. Deception Bay serves as the port, which helps us move the material from Raglan up until Sudbury. My name is Kip Noble, a master of Big One. I started off fishing with my father in a small community and worked my way up to a captain. There's not too much that exists here other than the mine. It's pretty remote. We have to ship the nickel out. Once we get alongside, the nickel concentrates in a very small powdered form. It gets transferred to the ship through pipeline. And once we're fully loaded, we let go from Deception Bay. Now we run into heavy ice, and sometimes it takes days just to move miles. This is always a challenge, but to get up in the morning and be challenged every day, that's, you know, it puts a little kick in your step. The Raglan concentrate comes to Quebec City. We unload it into rail cars, and we bring it to the Sudbury smelter. Sudbury's located a few hundred kilometers north of Toronto in Ontario. It's the gateway to the north, I guess you could say. And we've been operating here since 1929. In smelting, you're removing the sulfur from the material. You're also getting rid of some of the other materials that aren't so valuable, leaving behind more of the good things that we want to recover. We have a furnace that operates at about 1,380 degrees Celsius. The material gets dropped into the top, falls through, and hits the top of the bath. And that's when that smelting process begins. It's amazing to imagine 1,400 degrees. It's like thinking about trillions of dollars. It doesn't really mean anything to you because it's so far out of your experience. Our final product that we generate looks like a black beach sand, now about 60% nickel 
and about every two weeks we load a vessel destined for Nickelberg. Nickelberg is placed at the tip of southern Norway, just beside a city called Kristiansand. We make a very high quality nickel, and if you're talking about refined nickel, we're one of the biggest in the world. We uh, take in uh, the raw material coming from the smelters. And it's a complicated process. You're dissolving it in acid and then plating out the good stuff. You can imagine a huge bathtub with two plates, one that's a cathode and one that's an anode. And you, you put power on this one, electricity, and you kind of pushes the nickel to the cathode. And this cathode would just keep on growing. And in the end of one week's production time, we can harvest pure nickel. Glencore's customers need nickel. They don't need nickel and iron or nickel and chrome. They, they need nickel. Our nickel gets shipped out and sold to Glencore's customers all over the world and uses all kinds of different products. As a technical person, I find it really amazing all the different applications that nickel goes into. And it's 100% recyclable. I mean, it's true, like, you cannot destroy nickel. You can produce different forms of nickel, but in the end, you can always get nickel out of that product. That makes it unique among many materials. For example, once a rocket engine reaches the end of its life, it will go back to a nickel alloy mill to be made into a more efficient rocket engine. So it comes back into the economy, and it is circular whether it is through recycling or through mining in areas where we have communities. The idea is always that we produce nickel in a sustainable and a responsible fashion. What's most exciting is the growth of the EV market, and we have a solution for recycling the byproducts from that industry. The future of nickel is bright. I see it as an element of change, not only to build emerging economies, assets, and infrastructure, but also to be able to connect the world.